recorded live. Hello and welcome to the 109th episode of the Virtualization Security Podcast. And here I'm live from HP Discover. My name is Edward Kolecki, a.k.a. Text I Will, and author of several books you can find on Amazon. Joining me this week is Eben Rodriguez, who is a subject matter expert. And you now, what, you now work for NSS Labs, testing virtualization and cloud security products. That's, that's right. So, and hopefully the others will join us. When they do, I'll introduce them, and a few others may join me here. I do not know. But at HP Discover, it's actually every other word out of most of the keynotes was security, which was rather kind of interesting to see. And they have large booths and large signs here talking about their security uh, tools that they have. One of them is Haven, which is a combination of Hadoop, Autonomy, Vertica, Enterprise Security, ArcSight, and N types of apps, which is rather interesting. They built a big data platform that involves enterprise security. Now, granted, right now they're just using their logger inside of ArcSight to gather all the information, but part of their process is to do data governance, which is rather an intriguing aspect of big data. And so, that leads, yeah. Have you done any, uh, have you heard, what did you? What do you know about that? Um, other than a marketing blurb on a on a wall somewhere, did somebody talk about it? Because uh, the reason I asked, um, back a few companies ago, the um, we used HP's big data platform for static code analysis. Absolutely, they, they bought autonomy. a company called Fortify that would do the the code analysis, and uh, it wouldn't scale very well uh, the way they got it. So they ended up modifying Fortify so that it could. Uh, put the the code. It basically has to recompile the code and put it in a Hadoop big data farm. So instead of it taking four to five hours to scan a source code for a static code analysis of security, they would use a big data farm with Hadoop as a back end, make it much faster. Well, that's just Hadoop. Haven is a combination of a bunch of other products. Uh -huh. so Fortify reading Hadoop, that's actually a big step for Fortify, and I think that's a very worthwhile thing when you have a million lines of code, right? Right, right. So what they're talking about is using autonomy to handle the unstructured data, which all autonomy does is characterize the data so you can actually search it better. And then Vertica is their database equivalent to Greenplum, which, well, not even equivalent, but they do columnar data and then um, the enterprise security is ArcSight, which gives C, um, G, GRC insight into the access of the data and, and compliance of things. So right. they're really looking at it from that perspective, providing a loosely integrated set of tools. Hadoop is a big part of that to handle the map reduce part that autonomy and other tools need to do. Now, How's, how's HP hoping to um, monetize this? You know, is it an open source initiative, or are they going to make money off the professional services to set everything up? Uh, well, Haven, you, you, you buy a it's a commercial product. You you buy autonomy and you buy Vertico, or you buy them from together. So those are actually real products. The dupe is again is HP's version of it, but it's the real open source version. And the enterprise security part is ArcSight. So they combine those into one SKU. You buy them, and you have a loosely coupled um, tool suite. At least that's what it comes across as right now. So you can use them all to do your big data analysis. You build your apps on top of it. So they basically built a big a platform that you can code to using all the APIs available. The, so you can buy it today. But I imagine the biggest selling point for them is their professional services around all that to create the apps initially. Right. Even though there's APIs available for them, that, that's a fairly complex set of tools that you need to manage and control and you know, the program to. I mean, I'm sure there's some people that will do it. And I'm sure there's not a small price tag for either one of those. All right. This reminds me, um, some companies also use uh, Splunk as an example of instead of ArcSight for um, logging for security. And mm -hmm. uh, Splunk has some best practice white papers on how to use Hadoop in conjunction with Splunk. So you can have the data go into Splunk and then stored in Hadoop, or you can have it go into Hadoop and then use Splunk to report on what's in the Hadoop data store. 
Absolutely. And not only that, Splunk has a new product or enterprise security product that actually does its own data mining to show security events or what can be considered security events. So they actually use a combination of both, which is kind right. of cool. And I guess the challenge is, is, um, is it for compliance purposes or is it for true security? You know, that's where we get into the compliance means security. Well, ArcSight does GRC, so it does governance, risk, and compliance. But I think the enterprise security is trying to notify, trying to find yeah, Splunk's ES enterprise security, as it was as described to me, which is available now, um, is trying to find real security events as well as compliance issues. So, for example, if they know that you have your website's been hit from Russia 14 million times, well, you know, and you normally don't get hit from Russia, well, that's a big issue they're going to bring up and flag. So I do a little, they tie their application performance management tools into their security tools to get a better insight from a security perspective of what's happening in your application stack. So they're using their APM approach to do security analysis because they, they realize, and, and the people here at HP also realize that Application performance met metrics are the application is important to determining if it's secure because most attacks have moved up the stack. They've moved to be web attacks, they've moved to be application attacks versus hardware and operating system attacks. Now, granted, operating system attacks are still attempted, networking attacks are still attempted, but they're more successful these days with application attacks. So, moving up to the application to get data is what. Splunk is doing, what Haven is trying to do, and some they built a security tool on top of it to gather data so and, and do some 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 sort of analysis. So they actually have an example already of this. So this is a, a response uh, to um, the the problem or the challenge that we have with real time security. Uh, trying to prevent attacks is one thing, but yeah, uh, it, it, I, you're, you're right. It's continuous monitoring, continuous. Right. Security but you can't, I think we, we all agree with uh, insider threats and like uh, as we've seen lately in the news, um, you know, different uh, <laughs> insider threat problems, whether it's WikiLeaks or this, uh, this other new guy, uh, a determined insider, you know, is still going to be able to do things and, and the, the challenge is going to be detecting that. Um, exactly. Even, in a time, even if you can't a, prevent it. In a time frame that is reasonable. Right. Whatever that time frame is defined as, and I think reasonable as soon as possible to me would be as soon as possible. Well, a lot of these we talk about advanced persistent threats, right? A lot of these uh, insider things happen um, over a course of time. Like you know, they they'll do one or two little things to see you know how what they can get away with, but uh, you know they might take a few weeks as they're getting ready to you know move out of the country, you know. To, to prepare. So if you could catch it in a few days instead of waiting till a few weeks go by, you might be able to mitigate a lot of the data loss that you're having, your le data leakage. Now, a, dedica a dedicated insider or, or persistent insider, you're never going to be able to feed them. All you can do is find out as soon as possible that it happened. Because the insider is assumed to be safe and therefore can do tasks that normally an outsider would not be able to do, such as printing documents, even just carrying them out. How many people pat down for documents? A few, yes, but not every one of them. So data can leak in all sorts of ways. If they know the system because they built it, or if they know the system because they use it day in and day out, they also know the weaknesses, where an outsider yep. may not know those weaknesses. And doing the real-time analysis may be able to pick out what is behaviorally different. That's the big thing. That's what these 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 um, big data tools for security are doing is actually doing a modified form of behavioral analysis to find out is there something abnormal? If there is, it's something I need to look at. Do I normally get hit from my website from China? Well, if I don't, well, that'd be considered a normal, but I need to respond to the business. Maybe they opened up a new location in China. Therefore, that's going to happen. Well, the other thing right? is more of a policy issue is um, who's, who's watching the watchers, right? So if you, if you give uh, these really elite 
team of people super privileges over the whole nine yards of your enterprise, and you can see all the jewels of your kingdom. Um, you need some either tool or a person or te other team, you know, watching these guys and making sure they're in line and, and looking at their behavior patterns and whatnot. So it, it gets kind of crazy, you know, and I wonder if we can learn something about this from the banking industry or from other uh, regulated fields where they have already put controls in place. I know one, one example for, for, that I know about is from the banking industry. When um, a VP of a bank takes vacation, his uh, accounts are suspended so that he's not able to do remote access and come in and, and try to clean up any you know, paper trails that might have been left. So he might be asked to take two weeks vacation every year. And during those two weeks, uh, there's someone else that gets to really see what's going on. Well, I would agree with I would agree with implementing controls like that. I think it, it probably should be done for almost every employee everywhere. Because if you're on vacation, you shouldn't be accessing the business anyways. They really want you to take vacations for big businesses. For small businesses, they don't want you to take anything. It's a big, those are different. But I still think that those types of controls are worthwhile. And, and when you set your away maybe in your on vacation, maybe that's what it should be tied to. Because I mean, this was the whole problem. They fired a guy, remember the, the, the big break in the, for virtualization, they fired him, but they never shut down his accounts. Right. And because was, they never uh, shut down his accounts, like, well, that should have been part of being fired. That was the one where he went to a McDonald's and, and got back yeah. on and did something with vCenter, yeah. Absolutely. But you, you could have, uh, did they not delete his accounts at all, like, you know, VPN was even still working. and <laughs> Everything <laughs> everything was still working. You know, everything. That's a, a lack of a defense in depth and a good uh, HR onboarding, offboarding policy. And you're absolutely right. I mean, but everybody was, they, there was a whole failure in that. And that's what big data may be able to figure out is that was there a failure and where it was and how to correct it. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Good. Um, Michael Webster just joined us. Um, Long White Clouds, VCDXNZ001. Wow. Just ran like. I'm just breaking the last night's party. Ah, uh, yes, the Santana party. He went to it and he's broken. Yep. I did not go to it on the wake. Yeah. We <laughs> were dressed all day. So we're actually talking about the big data security stuff that's on the floor. Thanks. So um, big data a whole lot of uh, security potential issues, but it potentially solves a whole lot as well. Oh, yeah. It solves a lot, but it also opens up the whole concern about privacy. Privacy, yeah. It's a big concern. Absolutely. I was actually talking on the other, the other side they have on the big data services group. Right. I was talking to a, um, booth 511 for those that are listening. And what's really interesting was that... Um, we were talking about, oh yeah, we can do all sorts of big data. Where are you? Where are you with your big data? It's like that's not really what I want to talk about. Can you tell me how you ensure privacy? Yeah. And not only, I mean, like for right now, we can. There are ways to ingest PII and mask it, anonymize it, encrypt it, remove it. Those exist today. Yep. But when you take three distinctly different pieces of data, and I think it's only three, two to three or four pieces of data that you need that you can get a correlation that actually is derived PII. Yeah. So that you can uniquely identify the individual. And he gave it, the guy over there gave it a perfect example. He's from Europe, London. And he was saying, yeah, they were able to use a big data analysis to say, okay, this call, they found out that a guy with, um, had eye surgery on a certain date and he was a politician. Between the three of them, they were uniquely able to identify the person. Yeah. I mean, without a doubt. There's only one person that had eye surgery on that date that was a politician. Come on. That yeah. means privacy of the data now because the derived PII is real important. Well, it's more than that as well because the, the guys I was talking about yesterday about big data in particular uh, around the security of it, um, yeah, they take and they analyze whatever they get in. But once they get in some unique metadata, they can crawl the internet for additional data. So if you give them one piece of information, they can go out and crawl the internet for it additional information that can identify anything. So you, everything that you put online potentially is, is, is available to them. 
Yeah, it's all about data sources. Absolutely. That's a speed bump. Sorry. He's he's definitely dragging. Got to get him another. Got to get him another brew to figure this out. <laughs> Air this up. I'll get some at lunch time, I think. I hope so. So when you start thinking about all these different things, we, we, we there are tools like Splunk ES. There's Haven and their ops management stuff that actually pulls in security. I believe IBM has something. I mean, even if you look at um, uh, BC Ops from VMware has the ability to pull this stuff information in as well. No one does it, but they can pull it in. Yeah, well, that's the interesting thing about BC Ops, I guess, is most people don't know it can do non virtual machine stuff. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be machine analytics. It could be anything. It could be weather data. It could be call center volumes. It could be anything. It could be piped into BC Ops and analyzed and then trend it and feed into the rest of the system. So you got that's BC Ops Enterprise is the only one that can do that. Yeah, great, because you need plugins for this, right? You need the plugins and you need to write them all, and they have ingest forms from anything. Yeah. So the capability has existed for a while. Even do you know of any other big data tool? Well, there's also RSA Silvertail. Yeah. RSA Silvertail is specifically designed to do detect fraud, but also detect malware and and, and bad behavior. Again. It's a behavioral analysis. So we have three yeah. behavioral analysis tools, several other tools that can be used to do the exact same thing. Yeah. Do you know of any other even? Uh, no, not off the top of my head. Another thing, though. I, 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 just, I think um, a lot of companies are using big data uh, for security purposes, but they're doing roll their own tools. And so it's interesting to see this now sort of becoming more of a commercial integration offering where you integrate a number of different solutions. There's, there's yeah. lots of companies like, you know, commercial online realtors using, um, re retailers that is, using uh, big data uh, sort of after the fact. It's more reactive, not proactive. So they, uh, they use big data to feed their rules engines. The rules engines process uh, transactions on the fly. They, there's only really about 300 milliseconds that they have to be able to react to a transaction without affecting the user experience. And so those rules get updated from uh, a big data analysis, but the big data isn't really in line with the data. So we see more and more of that happening. And when you pull in the, the log data from the system, the application, and so forth, they're probably going through that to see if they've actually been hacked and whether or not these are fraudulent um, entries because of the location and the location of the actual web page and things like that. Yeah. Now, and then they can we, correlate that against some human data as well, maybe images or voice or whatever, you know. So yeah. if you're pulling in on the phone, giving your credit <laughs> card or answering security questions and they, they detect, you know, a variation in your voice from normal, potentially somebody could be holding a gun to your head. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. And they can pick that up in the voice and analyze that in real time. Well, think about a casino. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, at, we're in Vegas, and um, think about a casino. They have the best security analytics probably anywhere. Yeah. I mean, they do facial recognition. I just heard they, do, they actually analyze the way you walk. Really? So uh -huh. they can actually tell by who, who you are by the way you walk. They track you throughout everything. You know, they know how you make your bets. They know they track all this information and measure it and come back with, like, is that really you? Are you under pressure? Yeah. Should we call in? It's like, are there other things going on to determine if you're actually you're, you're cheating the system or, or, if, you've got a or, well, or yeah. if you have a yeah. health problem that they, don't, they want to take care of because yeah. this is all bad for business. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just amazing. And then they can correlate that with social media as well. I, mean, it's, I was talking to the Haven guys that are running the uh, HP Discover event here yesterday about just the information they can get from a single tweet and the metadata that that includes and then the rest of the data that they can infer or gather in in addition to that. And it's just huge. Oh, and, and believe me, the guys over in, uh, in the casinos are doing that day in and day out. Yeah. I mean, this is all automated. The, the, the best security in the world is from casinos. Yeah. I much. think it's even better than some governments because they have the money well, what, to pay. Well, what about um, we'd be remiss not to discuss uh, – the NSA's PRISM system, and if we're talking about big data and we're talking about security. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's come up a couple of times this week already. It, it has, with a lot of people saying, I'm sorry, I can't talk about that. Yeah. Um, it's been coming up. 
And there's yeah. a, a lot of, I mean, I brought it up a bunch of times, but there's a lot of discussions about the privacy of data, who owns the privacy of the data, is it something that I, if, but the problem is with data is it doesn't necessarily uniquely identify an individual usually, yeah. it identifies a persona. Yeah. Now sometimes those personas map directly to an individual because of credit card numbers, social security numbers, other identifying information. Or even IP is a location inside of a, 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 a static IP. I guarantee you they know you're coming from your house or your office. So they could probably identify a person that way. So, but well, it's identifying a persona that's the key. Be, be, the behavioral analysis is, is a very important way to uh, uh, confirm that two different personas are the same individual. Exactly. Um, but that generally... In the past, when I talked to um, CA, does a lot of research on behavioral analysis, like physical behavioral analysis, and they apply. They were telling me that the physical to determine if a person is a person by their behavior, specifically if it's actually absolutely that person, is a very yeah. hard task. So it's only applied to top people. What they're doing now with big data is they're taking that task and making it so they can actually get close enough. Yeah. They won't be able to do it like court of law, this is definitely that person. No. They can certainly get close enough. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing. It's all about reputation, and, and you're, you're making an assumption or you're making a guess. It's more of a hypothesis, and you need to assign a percentage of confidence to that hypothesis. And uh, the more data points you have and the longer you can look back at your data points, if, if it's not just one month of activity, it's like a year or years of activity, then you yeah. can actually, uh, you know, pr pr move a higher, move that confidence level up higher. So you can... But, but you also have to rule out certain things in that behavior. Say, for example, let's say I type a certain way on a keypad, yeah. right? And that can be picked up because of the way I hesitate to type in things and it gets into the, the form that way and maybe checking every character and it actually picks that up and transmits it over to wherever. When I do that, if I'm injured, that will change. Yeah. If I have a cold and not feeling well, that will change. And it will change well, that's, different. That's great. And that's exactly why you want to integrate data from like Facebook. I can see exactly why they're pulling in social media data, you know. You see the picture of the guy checking in on Foursquare at the doctor, you know, well, you know, the guy's yeah. sick or injured. So that could account for, and it used to be that humans had to deal with this and try to make smart decisions and humans make mistakes. Now it's all computerized, right? And that's really all we're talking about here is computerizing what people yeah. used to do uh, ineffectively, awesome. manually in the past. But it's very easy to not use social media. Yeah. So if you were using social media and then suddenly stop and your behavior change, well, that's a good sign. But if you've never used social media and now you're tracking behavior, you'll never know if the guy was in the hospital. So, you'll never so know here's the, the society of the future, Ed. Is, yeah. The society of the future is going to be like, hey, what's wrong with you? How come you're not using social media? Or what are you trying to hide? And those people um, are going to be naturally targeted. And let me give you an example. Well because, they're off, because they're off the grid. They're out, they're off the radar. Well, yeah. okay. So for certain things, uh, like government, tracking terrorists, maybe, you know, that's one thing. But if we're talking about an online retailer or a business who's trying to uh, do transactions, you know, you're, whether you're renting a movie off the Internet or purchasing something off the Internet or B2B type of network transactions where your uh, business is working with other businesses, you have a persona, you have an identity. And the more uh, data points you have about that persona, the more you can say with confidence that this persona maps directly to this person's identity or this company or entity's identity. So, for example, uh, they usually come from this IP address, you know, but sometimes they go from this other IP address. But when they are from these IP addresses, they're using these types of browsers or these types of computers. Uh, so Absolutely. You, you can build up a whole pattern set about things by automating the collection of this big data. Well, not only that, there is a, you can take data right now for, for any browser set any browser session, anywhere, there's enough information to create a unique ID across for that person. Yeah. And you, that persona, I should say, and that unique yeah. ID. 
can then be used as a comparative for future things. I know several companies doing this. It's, it's big in the search industry, for example. Absolutely. I guess what I'm saying is if, if you're not on watching. social media, it, you're going to have a lower trust rating because we have less data points on you than someone who has exactly the same number of data points, but they're also using social media. It'll give us yeah. a higher trust rating, a higher confidence that this persona is the person that they say they are. I don't know. I think you're right, but I'm not sure that that should be used at the scale because there are people that are actually not allowed to use social media. Yeah, especially once they walk up to hacking. Well, not those. Not just Maybe. those. Yeah. But there are people that are just li literally, by job, you're not allowed to use social media. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. For, well, there's certain, certain organizations. Yeah. Hey, hold on. Ed, Ed. I don't know if we yeah. can edit this out later, but uh, I can hear a single thing you guys are saying. Well, I was just saying there are certain groups of people that are not allowed to use social media at all. True. And not, me, okay, so we, we've actually out. run into this. We've run into this. And what happens is they, they might need an additional form of authentication uh, to increase their confidence level. So let's just say we have a confidence level from 0 to 100, where 100 is where there's absolutely no doubt that this is the person who they say they are. And, you know, 0 is we have no idea if, if this person got attacked or not and it would have no confidence. So let's say that um, with all the information we have on this person, they put in the right password, they're coming from the right IP address, uh, we can have a 50% confidence level this is who they say they are. With social media, we'd have a higher confidence level. So we might not have social media, like they, their Facebook cookie isn't up to date or their token isn't there. So we want to ask them for some other forms of identification that we can increase that confidence level. You know, a challenge response type system maybe. Where you yeah, ask the and unfortunately, I think that that's the wrong way to go. I would not say someone using social media is the right to boost confidence because most social media accounts can be hacked easily. So that would not, not if they're using two-factor authentication. You know, well, none of the social media companies use two-factor authentication, so there you go. Uh, Facebook. Well, Facebook's the only one, yeah. but I'm talking about the Twitter stream and, other, and Google Plus and other things like that. You know, Google has two-factor. Twitter, Google and Twitter both have two-factor. So that, that's I'm, all I'm saying most, is that you have that to... Requires, that requires people to turn it on, but again, most people, the vast majority of people out there do not. So using well, we're saying social the same media thing, as a confidence builder to me is saying, uh, so we have more confidence that's been... Okay. Oh, and what? If it's been hacked... Let's get more, so let's get more specific. So yeah. if, if so-and-so is authenticating to my site and they want to purchase this car off this website, how do I know that they are who they say they are? Well, I'm going to ask them to authenticate themselves. You know, we, we might do a phone screen where we have to call into a certain number or something. We might do, uh, you know, what's your mother's maiden name and all that kind of stuff. Or you might um, ask them to turn on two-factor authentication with Facebook or Google and uh, accept this uh, email response, for example. You know, yeah. there's all kinds of, of options. It could be SMS, text messages. I'm just saying that there's additional things you can do the more data points you have on somebody, the higher the confidence is that they are who they say they are. Yeah, the less it's, data it's, points. The less so just, if we just get back to the prism uh, for a second, there's two fundamental things I want to bring up. Firstly, there's a misconception in the public that their data is private, and it's simply not. As soon as anybody connects online, they should consider their data public information, and Absolutely. they should treat Treat that data that way, right? So anything they do essentially could wind up on the front page of the paper or in the FBI or the well, NSA. Right? What's interesting <laughs> about Prism is, uh, uh, on that note, exactly what you're saying is, uh, I guess the people in the UK have been dealing with this for years. They have video surveillance cameras everywhere, and everyone just accepts the fact that their life is yeah. an open book if you're outside walking around on the street. Your so driver's they, license, I mean, your a car license plate, right, is scanned yeah. every time you move. And they know yep. who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. <laughs> and the second thing I'll say about it is it can't be very good, because if it was, it would have seen Edward uh, Snowden coming. Exactly. <laughs> Thank it would have, you. It would have, if, the, if the heuristics and analytics were that good, they would have seen him coming. But the other thing is, is that when you start talking about it, I mean, the expectation of privacy is still there. Yeah. Regardless of whether or not we, can, we keep on telling people, yeah, your data is not there. Most people don't realize that email is not secure. 
And they say, well, why? I'm going from point A to B as an expectation of privacy. Well, email never had an expectation of privacy because it's store and forward, which means I store it on one server, I send it to another, it stores yeah. it, forwards it, and so forth. It could be a thousand servers between me and you. Yeah. yeah. So previously, though, it was very hard to accept or hack it because there was just so much of it, and you couldn't pick out from the stream an individual thing that you're looking for. But now with these big data systems, it's easy. It, it's easy. Everything's easy. I mean, you could connect in Haven to all of the cameras at all the airports in the country, right? And you could basically pick up behavior without even needing customs guys there at all. You could basically just have a trust, um, a confidence level produced as somebody's walking off the plane. What do you need a person wow. there snapping a for anymore, you know? Wow. Well, you just need cops to arrest you. Well, exactly. That's what you need, just the cops to arrest you. Yeah. It, it reminds me of that TV program. I can't remember the name of it, but the machine, the guy created the machine and it's looking at all the cameras in New York City and just tracking all of that information. Haven could pretty much do that. Oh, uh, person of interest. Person of interest, yeah. 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 So that's pretty much that. That's like a fictional program, but the technology now exists for that to be real. We have a lot more programming than that's in there right now, and, and a hell of a lot of storage. So you know, if I was going to buy some stocks, I'd be buying storage companies because the amount of storage growth is just going to completely explode, as as it already has. So I mean, as an individual, assuming all my data is public once I go on the internet, what should I do? Well, first off. I mean, my recommendation is that if you're going to use a cloud service or any service, ensure your data is encrypted before yeah, it gets absolutely. there. And yeah. the second one is if you're using Twitter or any of these other social media services, don't use things like Foursquare that identify where you are. Keep your address <laughs> of all the stuff. I mean, you're just well, telling actually, the people that the house is empty. Thank you. Actually, you know what, Ed, my, my theory on that is if, if I, uh, in my life is normally an open book, then the other activities I might want to do would get lost in the noise because it's hard yeah. to sort through. I don't know. That's but one theory. The, the other thing is you can use these um, anonymizers. Like, you know what Tor is, T-O-R? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. The onion router. That is almost impossible to, uh, to figure out who's doing what on there. And well, actually, uh, law enforcement okay. and, and drug enforcement agencies, they use that to interact with drug dealers, for example. Yeah, the yeah. onion ring. And yeah, the, the onion so ring. I, I was actually talking to another company here on the show floor. It's one of HP's partners, and they're, they're actually one of the first out of Stanford's mathematical department. Yeah. Oh, wow. to, which is cool. They have a way to visualize big data. Right. You yeah. can, and and well, I... I Believe me, I'm not a mathematician. I didn't understand it. And they actually have one for viruses and, and system calls and things like that and able to target, where, figure out good versus bad yeah. systems. But one of the things that they didn't know about was Tor. So I told them that they actually do a na website analysis. They're actually going to plug Tor into their big data system. And they'll try to figure out if they can use it, to, uh, it whether or not it's actually truly anonymizing data. Yeah. Which is rather intriguing, if you ask me. Just uh, speaking about big data and, and things like that, it just reminded me uh, about a, a company that I'm a shareholder in, and they basically collect information about network traffic attacks and all sorts all over the globe um, through their routers and things like that. And the amount of data and information they get is incredible. And the value that that could have to those malware-type or virus-type companies and the visualization that they can do and report off it is just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think, so at the moment, their devices are what's making the money. But in the future, I think the big data is going to make them more money than the devices that ever made them. And they're going to be a massive acquisition target for one of these big networking companies or big security companies. And it's all about the data. I mean, it's all about the data, yeah. So let's think about this one. What do I need to do to this data to protect my personal privacy? Well, not have it there or encrypt it or build into the platforms the ability to opt out of it being in there. Yeah. So yeah. that when I go to Google, I mean, perfect example, and I've actually been thinking about this one a lot, it's like I'm planning a, a surprise for my wife for the anniversary, her anniversary, our anniversary. And I've started that now. Now, granted, she and I use different computers. Yeah. So she doesn't see what I get on Google. She sees what she looks up on Google. As that, Does she listen to your podcast, Ed? Huh? She just no, do it, she doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't. 
Okay, I was going to say, otherwise, it's over, man. You already gave it up. <laughs> I already gave it up, but she still doesn't know. But one of the things is, is that if I'm looking up stuff, that advertisement, that I'll be now targeted with advertisements on Google yeah. for the things I was looking up. Yeah. She was, she, a lot of families share computers so, yeah, and, and, phone. and yeah. phones. So if I was doing that, they would get the ads for it and figure out that, hey, this was a surprise, so it's no longer a surprise. Yeah. And it kind of spoils the whole thing. And to be honest, big data could spoil my surprise for even my own uh, an anniversary, yeah. which is kind of a big yeah. issue. I mean, you're now delving into my private life and affecting it yeah. adversely. That's why they invented private browser sessions. Yeah, you know? It's true. Because then it deletes all of the previous history as soon as you shut the window. Yeah, but it doesn't delete the apps. It's the ads that show up from Google. Yeah, but if you've got a cookie during that session, it's gone. It doesn't make any difference. They know your persona. Right, yeah. It's a persona-based ad. Yeah. It's not a cookie-based ad. Because I delete yeah. my cookies and the ads still appear. Yeah. So I guess if we bring this back maybe to a little bit of virtualization or cloud, the thing is if you're going to run in a cloud environment or a virtual environment of any sort and it's not yours and you don't control it, then you've got to encrypt. Absolutely. And you've, you've, you've got to keep that data a secret and it basically assume that if it's unencrypted, anybody's got access to it. Unfortunately, when you look at that, when you encrypt up and down the stack, the keys in the virtual environment, the keys for that encrypted data are actually in the virtual environment. Yes. They're not separate yet. There's no HSM in use. There's no network HSM. And even if it was a network HSM, they copy the key into memory to use it, and the cloud admins can get that key at any time. Yeah. So you've got this whole issue with you don't have you don't have enough encryption in the cloud to actually protect you from the cloud. Yeah. If they knew how to do it, they could get the data at any time and decrypt your data and still plug it into the Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is a big yeah. issue for big data. Now private companies like Private Core and the hardware solutions for encrypted memory are actually coming. Yeah. Private core does that at layer three, which is really cool. It needs to be built in the operating system. Like, so it's not built in the operating system. Has to be built into the hypervisor. Well, yeah, that, well, that, yeah, yeah. It's a hypervisor world. Yeah. But then you have companies, things like Moonshot, where you need to actually build it to the, the operating system. Well, yeah, but the thing with Moonshot is, yeah, it's only ARM and, and that sort of thing right now. But the no, low, Adam as well. Well, Adam, yeah, but the low-powered Xeons are coming. So as soon as you've got the low-powered Xeons, you can just run a normal hypervisor on it. Yeah. So if you can run it in eight gigs. Well, no, it's a sizes are increasing as well. That's what they're getting. Yeah. So, so some interesting stuff. Well. It's interesting stuff. And, and, and Moonshot's actually huge. I mean, you've got 45 servers, or soon four times that, 180 servers, yeah. in one box. Yeah. 1,800 servers in a rack. Yeah. Yeah. It's impressive. So you can do big data with a four, five, six U box. Yeah. Fast. Yeah. Very fast. It's a pity it's not really needed. <laughs> you know, because if you look at it, if you just had a highly optimized virtualized environment, you could do, you could basically get the same economics and uh, power consumption and everything else today. You just don't use the resources I don't know. well enough. I don't know, because an enterprise license for vSphere, for example, is for 1,800 servers is expensive. Yeah, but you wouldn't use 1,800 servers, that's the whole point. Well, if you want, if you want to a fraction of the number of yeah. servers. Yeah, but there's a lot of people that are doing a thousand servers now. Yeah, but the problem is they're all still underutilized. So yeah. virtualization has taken them from like five percent to maybe twenty percent utilization, and that's just CPU. Memory is probably maybe you know, sixty, seventy percent. But most organizations are not really highly using their infrastructure, and then if they are using compute, then they're not highly utilizing the other parts of the infrastructure, like the storage networks or the or the normal networks or the storage or anything. So they basically have CPU and power to burn to do actual security tasks. Absolutely. Which is a big, that's a big yeah. message. Yeah. There's so much wasted IT resources out there, it's not funny. And it's actually, a, it's, a, it's a fear issue of putting all your eggs in one basket. Why should I do 100 VMs when my, I'm only going to trust 20 in there? Okay. Where, I mean, I don't know about you, Michael, but I do consistently over 100 VMs in enough. That's just consistent. Yeah. It, but that's my level of trust in the environment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I've got customers that do that as well, as well, 100 per node. Uh, so get, by getting back to security, you've got this ability to now 
effectively burn cores for security in your environments today, which actually that leads to something you were taught, you were doing um, even your um, what you're doing. You've been tweeting about the stuff you've been doing at NSS Labs. You want to go over that a little bit? Yeah, I mean we've we've tweeted about a lot of things. Which uh, which one were you um, thinking about here specifically? And just go over a few of them. Well, um, I'll tell you what I'm working on, which is pretty exciting for me, and that is uh, we're building out a uh, a test lab. The NSS Labs has historically tested individual devices like firewalls, uh, intrusion detection systems, and uh, they're doing web application filters and other types of appliances like that. But um, now with software-defined networking, network function virtualization, we need to be able to test that at a much larger scale. So um, to, to do that, we've, we've, we're starting small, <laughs> which for me, small is 40 physical servers. Um, and they have a, a ton of memory, really fast processors, SSD drives, and we're looking at putting a, a SAN on there so that we can have shared storage. And we're going to see how big we can actually grow this 40 node environment. How many virtual machines can we put on there? What type of compute throughput can we go on there? There's people wanting to see if they can make Bitcoins on here. Uh, there's people wanting to decrypt uh, encryption algorithms. You know, uh, encryption keys, and, and we're going to be trying all sorts of different things out with that. So that's what I'm looking for. You tweeted something about you think you're secure and you're not. That one. Um, yes. Okay. So one of the exciting things that we've been we we've been doing these firewall tests for years, and uh, there's uh, there's this policy that you always hear people talking about defense in depth. You know. If uh, some companies actually have a dual vendor policy where they, they have two firewalls, vendor A and vendor B, and they put them in line so that uh, whatever attack might possibly get past vendor A, vendor B will pick it up. And so we've been doing analysis. Uh, NSS Labs has uh, developed a test suite with thousands of different viruses, Metasploit, and other types of attacks, as well as custom scripts that they use to uh, replicate uh, attacker traffic. And they, they been able to very successfully break a number of vendors' firewalls and help those vendors improve their products and make them more secure. So one of the things we did is look at the analysis of which attacks get through uh, one firewall or two firewalls combined. And uh, uh, amazingly enough, um, having two firewalls does not uh, really ensure that much better security. Uh, there is only one magic combination that uh, prevented uh, all of the attacks we could throw at it from getting through. And so the, there's two parts to this story. The first part is that uh, PDF that we put up there on our website that uh, sort of talks about the test, but it doesn't really give a lot of details about it right now. It's kind of a teaser. We're um, going to be releasing the second part of the report with more details in a week or two. And uh, I personally uh, have read just the high-level part, and um, it's, it's pretty exciting to see that all these myths of the past, like security and uh, defense in depth, don't necessarily guarantee better security. So you need to be very careful uh, about how you set up your stuff and the assumptions that you make. And this is what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast is we're moving from being a uh, I got the firewall so I'm secure type of model, that M&M security approach where it's hard on the outside and soft on the middle, to really thinking, looking at the data and looking at activity and events. And that's where I'm excited about this big data stuff because I think it's really going to help move the, the needle to make uh, enterprises more secure by yeah. you know, saying we, we've done a, a good initial path, kind of like a bank. You know, you got the video cameras. we got the guard at the front door. we got all the basic things in place, but we still need detection methods in place with double booking, accounting, and whatnot to let us know who has got their hand in the jar so that we can see that stuff even after the fact. Because you're going to have trusted insiders that are going to always be able to do things. So we need to start watching them and looking at their behavior patterns. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then can you give us any hints of what the combination was? Have any of the virtual firewalls been tested? Um, so all of, all of the virtual firewalls that we've looked at are pretty much the same as the physical firewalls, meaning that they use kind of the same signatures and. Uh, the, the UI to manage them is the same. Uh, as far as hypervisor-based firewalls, maybe using VM safe, some of the stuff you and I have talked about, Ed, that's, uh, that's stuff we're going to be looking at in three to six months. So um, 
for now, it's, you know, whether it's a Palo Alto, a Cisco, a Juniper, Stonesoft, you know, whoever makes the firewall, Dell Sonicwall, et cetera, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's no one secret combination that I know of yet. Uh, like I said, the, research, the researcher has that data, and uh, they're, they're looking at how to present that right now. And then you're going to build out clouds and test the security of clouds as well, I'm assuming, like yes. OpenStack yes. So and the Cloud Director and all those. Exactly. And, I, and if I can put in a plug, uh, we're actually hiring. So I'll be updating the website um, tonight with uh, some of our job openings for this, uh, this exciting uh, testing that we're going to be doing over the next few months. That's pretty cool. Well, one other thing that's actually really big news that just came out on the 15th of well, five, was it 515? Yes, 515 was released as a draft of the NIST Cloud Computing Security Reference Architecture. Oh. And that's really big news. Is it um, uh, similar to your reference architecture at all? <laughs> I'm still going through it. I think it's a higher level, actually. The uh -huh. NIST Special Publication 500-299, again, 500-299, it's right. the NIST Cloud Computing Security Reference Architecture, and it just came out, basically, and that's actually big news. Right on. I think it's big news anyways. Yeah, that is awesome. That will give everybody sort of a – I mean, I, I was starting to look at yours and, and seeing how we can use it, but it's also good to have sort of a, a centralized government sort of based one that so everyone can be at the same page. From NIST is the organization that sets the standards, right? So and they have, have well, they, they, there's some debate whether or not some of their stuff is really a standard. They are a standard for, I mean, they're National Institute of Standards and Technology, but whether or not their definition of a cloud is considered the definition of a cloud and whether or not ANISA agrees with it and the, the Europeans agree with it is a totally different thing. So, but it's a good yeah. starting point that they have it. It's not international, right? No, it's not. However, it's some of them have been adopted for international. Oh, okay. So that's actually big news. That's actually out. Are there. you going to have the link to that on your website for those of us who uh, don't know how eventually, to? Eventually, eventually, yes. I will put it I on the show. I now. don't want the uh, when I do a Google search for it. I don't want the government uh, seeing that I was searching for it and wondering what I'm up to. <laughs> no, they'll know you've gotten it anyway. <laughs> oh, are you in cahoots? <laughs> NSA wants No, no. Like, like you, you've got to go to their site to get it. So do you guys? Uh, this is really um, interesting because, uh, you know, we've been talking about this as a society for years. Uh, everyone knows the book uh, Fahrenheit 451, and there's been fears about people actually going to um, get their books, you know, electronically, like if you get a, a Kindle or a Nook or something, because you don't want the government to know what you're reading, you know. Um, what do you guys think about that sort of stuff? Well, Michael said to say hello, uh, and goodbye. He had to go. He has to catch his flight back to New Zealand. But I think um, I, I've been thinking about 451 for a while, with Fahrenheit 451. Are we there? No, I don't think books will ever go away. Paper, paper books, right? Paper books will go away. Um, but do people ignore them and... We um, basically get back to the point where they're just listening to people on the news and the talking heads. Right. Yeah, I think we're actually forming a fairly um, controlled society. Right. Because we're completely the media is controlled or can be. We get one message from the media, but if you don't read enough locations, you will get only one message. Right. So there's a lot of, right now, I don't think we're even close because there's a lot of other avenues to get that information that are still exist. As long as those still exist, people just need to know that they exist, and then they'll go and go to them. So people that do know are not going to get caught. I mean, we cannot get to the point where we have given up all our freedom just for security. Yep. And that's what, that could, that's what could happen, something to think about. Is so there... Let's go back to, I mean, I really don't want to talk about the NSA prison stuff much because <laughs> there's still a lot of information that's unknown. Right. All we're doing is guessing. We do know that big data technology was involved. We do know that probably Hadoop, we probably make guesses on what else was involved. 
But right. when we go back and talk about big data security solutions, we need to realize that the same data we're gathering for security can be abused. Yes, absolutely. Right? So there needs to be strict controls and data governance is what they're talking about at HP Discover a lot is the data governance around that data to govern who can access it, how it can be used, and so forth. And that's really a legal and political distinction that still hmm. is being developed today. But it all starts with one simple thing. You can't do data governance unless you classify your data in some fashion. But you need to actually ensure that there's data classification first. And big data yep. falls into that classification study as well. Yep. And once you classify it, then you can govern it. Now, those Agreed. Are the big issues, those are the big and issues I wonder, that are coming out right now. I wonder how many consumers are doing that for their personal or family stuff, you know? They assume that what they do on Facebook or online or on their home computer or on the uh, Google Mail or Yahoo Mail, they assume that that's, ah, you know, who cares about that, right? I wonder uh, why should we care? Well, you're right. And, I mean, to be honest, I've been thinking about it a lot. So I do things on Facebook, Twitter that, I consider very carefully what I put up there. Everybody should. And that's, we're, I mean, as a consumer, as an individual, we're responsible for our own lives. We need to step up and take that responsibility. Yep. We can't depend on Google and the big corporations to do it because they're corporations. They're there for a reason. And that's to yep. make money. Yep. They're not there to necessarily protect the consumer except where it's dictated by law or compliance requirements are fine. So the consumer needs to take responsibility for their own actions, words, technology, technology uses. Yeah, so I guess a, one of these, a one lot of, these of that they don't under, they're not educated to even know what to look yeah. for. Exactly. And that's, that's, that requires some education, and that's where the press can come in and help. In, yeah. in other people that are now analysts and stuff that are well known, they can actually talk about that. One of the things I would love to do on a future podcast for those people that are listening in, and that is give a list of those things you can do as a technologist at a conference to secure your environment yourself. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a good dozen or so of those that you can do today without impacting usability, but will provide better security overall as an individual. Right. All right. I think that that's something that would be a really good podcast to do. What are, uh, before, can you mention a couple future. of them as we wrap up here? Can you mention like two or three things that you think would be, uh, would be discussed? I think one of them is not to use things like Foursquare. <laughs> okay. I, I use Foursquare all the time. <laughs> because it identifies where you are. And if you want, if you're being targeted, they want to know where you are or where you're not. If your house so what do you mean targeted? targeted? Who, who, who would I be if afraid of targeting me? Um, it could be protecting yourselves from the government. It could be as, as much as protecting yourself from criminals and thieves. Right. I mean, they may say you're, I mean, they, they found you on all sorts of places and say, well, your house is a good target because you're a technologist. You tell people you're not there, and gives them, and you're not there for a week. Like you're in Vegas, they can assume you're going to be there, gone for a while, you know. And you keep on retweeting and reusing Foursquare throughout the week. Well, yeah, it's like a good measure to say you're going to stay out there, and you're tweeting about it. That's a stream that they can pick up on. That's the criminals use it today to target houses. Another good one is if you're using a um, Bluetooth keyboard. For example, for your iPad or iPhone or other tablet, is to never type in a password on your Bluetooth keyboard. Always do it on. Oh, screen. oh, really? Yeah, because the Bluetooth, is, Bluetooth keyboard is a, a signal, and your password's not encrypted. It's not encrypted on the Bluetooth. Well, well, they say it is, but it's an easily breakable, breakable encryption, and it can be picked up from two miles away with a big enough antenna. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, gosh, I don't know how many people use Bluetooth keyboards <laughs> all the time. You know. Exactly. So it's a big deal. So you always use the on-screen keyboard for typing in passwords and possibly usernames. 
another a, a third thing would be is never access your bank or do shopping while traveling online because you cannot oh, wow. trust the local Wi-Fi. Oh yeah, when you're at a Wi-Fi like a shared spot, yeah. Even you, you can't even trust um, cellular because the conference convention centers put big cellular towers in the ceilings that basically convert from cellular to Wi-Fi. Wow. So those are things you need to come. Those are the top three for me. Okay, cool. So That'd I think, be a good I think podcast a lot, to have. I think there's a lot more, and we need to find the um, end-user computing um, specialist to talk about it, but I think those are three good ways to start, and they'll protect your privacy and, and your own self while you're traveling. Right on. So, right on. Well, thank you very much, Ethan, for joining us, and thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the 109th episode of the Virtualization Security Patches. I'd like to thank Michael Webster for stepping in for a little bit of all he could. And I will see you guys in two weeks where we have another good show um, coming up on our 110th episode, and we look forward to talking to it. Thank you very much. Right on.
Talk Recorded live. Hello and welcome to the Virtualization Security Roundtable podca- round Podcast, episode number 110. We have a special guest with us, um, Simon Crosby and Tal Klein from Bromium. Simon is the CEO, I believe, still? Uh, CTO. CTO, no, sorry, yeah. CTO. And Tal, what is your exact role there? I never can figure it out. Uh, I'm in charge of janitorial, janitorial engineering. I mostly clean up Simon's messes, uh, and on occasion also uh, use Windex on the windows when birds run into them. Okay. <laughs> and we have joining us Ivan Rodriguez, who's an ID, IT industry veteran, now serving as the Director of Virtualization and Cloud Testing at NSS Labs. Normally also joining us is Michael Berman and Mike Foley, both of them are industry experts, but they won't be able to join us today. They're traveling and or in meetings, which, oh, well, it happens. So for all you guys listening to us, uh, my name is Edward Holetke, a.k.a. Will, and author, technologist. Look me up on Amazon if you want to or LinkedIn and have fun. The conversation today is really a it's, it's kind of came off of a lot. This is the conference season. Almost every one of us has been to a conference or two. And for us security people, we walk into those conferences rather petrified at times. And the idea is how do you go to a conference or travel with your technology safely? And that means safely accessing your remote locations as well as use of your devices. And three that ca- three things that came up last time we had the podcast at the end of HP Discover was basically don't use somebody else's charger for your iPhone, iPod, smartphone. Use your own, that one that you know you have control of. Um, Or use your own cables, ones that literally plug into a wall jack, not one that plugs into a USB hub. And the other one was um, pay attention to your surroundings, of course, situational awareness. Make sure no one's looking over your shoulder as you type in things. And if you have a Bluetooth keyboard, don't use it for passwords, use it for everything else, or don't use it for sensitive data. So I noticed you didn't say anything about Wi-Fi. Is that uh, on the list or off the list or? Well, Tal, I mean, mean, what do you think? Well, so first of all, as you know, I, one of my my, uh, primary pet peeves is Whenever, you know, as, especially as a vendor, you end up paying like thousands of dollars for Internet access on a daily basis for what they call high-speed Internet access, uh, you know, which ultimately really ends up being about a 56K modem that's shared across about 300 vendors. Now, so, wait a second. Let me uh, ask you a question about that. You mean as a vendor at a conference, right? So when yeah. you have your booth on the expo show floor? That's right. I mean, I could I could speak to it both as you know, as an attendee and as a vendor. Do you want to talk about it? You know, you know. No, let's talk one. about your experience. What you know? What do you see from your perspective? And and honestly, that, that's the thing. So then they put they put you on this they put you on this network usually, and and if you run, you know, if you if you you know just sniff the traffic, you just see everybody's just messy, and then everyone is also setting up their own uh, their own um, hotspots around you, which basically destroys any signal that you have and they never give you five gig signal they never give you actually a five gig signal so so basically your wi-fi is useless as soon as the conference starts uh so both from a security perspective um you know I, i've actually learned to start ordering hard lines uh and and that i don't know I, haven't, I don't think about it in the context of security so much but um you know i guess you you would do it that way i just order a hard line that gets dropped from the ceiling and i don't i don't use the show wi-fi at all because it's just never been right. reliable. um so even um you know even you if you confidentiality be- integrity and availability so you're worried about availability there i worry yeah, i'm worried about availability i mean the the other thing is uh we'll get into i mean generally uh, having joined bromium I, I don't worry about a lot of things uh that i used to worry about. <laughs> Okay, but um, but I, the other thing is, you know, when I do have to do roaming demos, like a lot of times I'll have to go around and you know do a demo for someone. Uh, I'll either tether my phone or use my MiFi, you know. Um, and uh, okay, Ed, Ed had a comment on that at the last show because a lot of uh, conference centers have problems with um, their, you know, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. 
will have so what they use is wireless they extenders use, there. Yeah, they use wireless extender. Well, they no, they use um, cellular extenders that are actually also Wi-Fi hotspots. So what ends up happening is they take the cellular extender, convert it to Wi-Fi, and send it over the net. And then it comes back and it speaks to you on cellular, but it's gone over the wire, which everybody and their uncle can see. Now, some vendors don't do that. Others do. And I don't know which ones, which cellular vendors do what, which one. But they yes, are. Sir. It is possible that the cellular extender you have in, like, Moscone or in um, the SANS or any of those other are actually being used are just Wi-Fi. They're cellular extenders that go to Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, what was it? In New York, there was um, New York City. There's a good chance that when you bring up your cell phone, you're actually talking over Wi-Fi anyways. Whether yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, I heard about that. I, I data think... because of all the AT&T so there's a, Bell there's, a, stations. there's a cool company, and I have to be very careful here because I'm in the full interest, full disclosure, I'm an advisor to them, but these are guys out of University of, uh, of California in San Diego, and the company is called Mushroom Networks, and they produce this awesome little widget. You bring in as many different Wi-Fi, uh, different um, 3 or 4G cards, as you can lay your hands on, you jam them in the back of the box, and it does striping across all of them, and you get very high bandwidth connections hmm. from wherever you are. So it stripes across multiple carriers, does reassembly, so it does the far end of the reassembly up in AWS, and then you just get onto the big internet. Hmm. It's totally yeah, cool. Yeah, I've heard of that one. That sounds really cool. So we're talking about a few things. We're talking about um, availability, but we're also talking about uh, you know confidentiality of our data. So I've always heard when you go to any kind of public hotspot, it's okay to use the wireless as long as you VPN back into the office and you're using, you know, like two-factor authentication or something. Is that still good I advice? No, I, you know, and, and you only are using pre-shared certificates. Don't assume your SSL, SSL VPN, if you don't have the certificate of the server on, both that, on your side, is actually going okay. to work. Well, that's good advice, and I think that's actually more standard nowadays a lot of corporate enterprise using the VPN on demand with pre shared certificates. Uh, yeah, there's also no, I mean, uh, when you connect to VPN, there's no guarantee that 100% of your traffic is going to be routed over that VPN. In fact, it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. That is, if I'm, I mean, seriously, I, I'm beginning to question the value of the enterprise network at all in the sense that, um, you know, if, why as a corporation do I want to pull the dirty web through all of my corporate stuff anyway? I mean, why not just let the user go safely to the dirty web and all that stuff, you know, on their own on their own account, and then let the user do a per application based connection to right. the, the application, whatever happens to be SaaS or in my private cloud. Uh, I, like well, I, mean, I, I got a I got a case in point for you even is that one of the VPNs that I have, the endpoint also happens to be. I mean, if you're dealing with NATs and so forth, the endpoint could be a separate machine, but the endpoint address is also used by some of your your you're a customer facing IPs for small businesses. Yes, so you have right. a lot of shared resources and you think you're going through your VPN to access your admin page when you're really not. Right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's <laughs> and the thing is is like for a small company that has a VPN buried somewhere in their DMZ, you know, this could really happen that you just hit the wrong port and you're forget it, you're just not doing it. Because I of the routing inside your own DMZ. I can give you an re easy use case. You know, uh, one time uh, this happened to me at, uh, when I was with my previous employer. You know, what I was I was on Gmail and uh, it, and then after connecting to Gmail over public Wi-Fi, I then connected to the VPN. But I noticed that you know, um, basically my Gmail traffic was still going out through like basically not going over the VPN. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, because you mm -hmm. had an established session. That's right. All right. So, okay, let's take this back a step. I, I, we're talking about a lot of things like how to be cautious when you go to a conference. What types of advice would you guys offer to um, data center or IT architects who are, you know, purchasing new applications, getting ready to upgrade their infrastructure? Simon, you mentioned, you know, why even bother with VPNs anymore? So what's the future look like, and what type of technology is now available so that we can revisit these, these sort of myths or assumptions that we have? So I think the... I mean, the traditional notion of extending the enterprise perimeter to wherever the user happens to be, that's what a VPN is, is just a daft idea. 
because the user is in a dangerous place, and the first opportunity that malware gets when it compromises the endpoint is going to go down the VPN and come into the enterprise. That is, yeah. The other consideration is it's not just the user on their laptop anymore, right? It's uh, they have all these different. They go with the iPad, the cell phone, yes. the laptop, and everything else. Exactly. There's and a good so, chance you can't get a you can't get your flavor of VPN on those devices anyway. So then they'll end up using another okay. type of VPN, which actually is not supported by the by the There's another challenge. There's another challenge in the in the VPN thing. So I talked to a CIO who says, "Well, my users all use a VPN to get on the internet, even." Now. So here's the consequence of that: the user is lugging around a brick, okay, and then they cannot use it until they're on the on the on the VPN. However, there are there is an, good anecdotal evidence that in certain cities in the world, 80% of of captive portals in hotels and various other places will feed you malware at the point at which you try to get internet connectivity. Okay? And so you you cannot even get onto your VPN before you get attacked. That is, you have to get an IP address. Okay. And so, think about that. Why is this the case? Why is it possible? Oh, because the infrastructure was designed to lie to us. You see, you go HTTPS, mysecurecompany.com. And what happens? Well, first of all, the DNS is not your DNS, it lies to you, it says, oh, that's me, right? And it, and then you get fed some crap back by some fake my first website. Clue, my first clue that's happening is when uh, I always have Outlook running, you know, I never quit it, and it tries to reconnect and it pops up a warning saying uh, the SSL certificate is different, right? Because it's yeah. intercepted me. Exactly. And if you're on a Mac, by the way, what you on a, on a Mac, what you get is, uh, I couldn't really resolve the certificate for this thing, we, uh, should I continue anyway? And I bet you half the people on the planet say yes. <laughs> At which point, your Mac mail cloud is trying to connect to some you know, potentially dastardly thing, right? Anyway, but getting on the VPN is a problem, right? And so you have to be able to, I mean, the, the Brahmian view of the world is that we have to assume that the world is out to get us at every point. So the USB key that you pick up in the corridor, you know, the very first piece of network infrastructure you can, you talk to is going to try and get you, and uh, and unless you're working on that assumption, you're in deep trouble, in my view. So I what's the solution? I would, I would I would I would agree with you there, and also I think there's one step further. If you are doing, I mean, there's a few things that you should never do from a conference, in my opinion, and that is never access your bank. <laughs> that would be a really bad thing. Never access yeah, so anything that's critical. That. I think it's worthwhile talking about the categories of threats, okay? So there's... Yeah. I mean, so... And I, I want to be very cautious about overly advocating a Bromium architecture. A Bromium architecture would get you to the point where you're totally safe in doing anything, in interacting with an application. So a web-based application or anything as else. As long as you're totally using a Windows machine. Currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. It won't work on my iPad. It won't work on my Mac. It won't work on yes. my... My my Android tablet. True. So if I have a Windows-based PC, which if you I mean I mean you know this as well as I do, Simon. You go to a conference, and I would say seventy percent of all the equipment there is not Windows. It depends which conference you go to. If you go to TechEd, that's not true. But well, TechEd is the complete opposite. But yes, I mean I'm talking about if you're going to like a VMworld, an RSA conference, um, a Interopt. You yeah, know. whatever. Yes, that's true. Yeah, but, but it, um, I'll have a funny. I have a funny story there, by the way. There's this opposite the Apple headquarters in Cupertino is a new hotel. <coughs> I ended up staying there the other night, and this thing's got, of course, all the latest and greatest Apple gear. So if you peek over the desk of the check-in person, it's all running Windows. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I mean, that's so beautiful, right? Because none they of have, stuff. they have like a remote desktop. Session to a Windows server somewhere. No, no, Windows running on on Mac devices. Oh, okay. yeah, Hope as a Parallels <laughs> or something else. Yeah, uh, just Windows installed on. By the way, Windows hardware, uh, Apple hardware is awesome for running Windows. Um, but but you're quite correct. So so the problem. So in a Bromium environment, the vul- the remaining vulnerability. I want to be very clear to point it out, is that there is a driver bug for some LAN-based attack, some worm manages to corrupt the driver in which owns that piece of hardware, at which point, you know, 
okay, you're all up. Everything's gone, right? But beyond that, we're good. So our vulnerability then is to an attack, which is um, essentially, a, a, I say, a driver, a fundamental driver bug. Now, if you historically, if you go to things like Black Hat, you know, there was things like a bug in the Atheros, you know, hardware or firmware or something, right? Somebody can get that to flip, then then you're all down. You know, everybody is still vulnerable there because everybody still has that same Atheros driver, whether it's Apple or Windows. That's the mm-hmm. fun So, you know, we're all vulnerable at that point. Um, beyond, so out, outside of a Bromium context, uh, I think it's pretty scary, actually. Um, you so know, in, I, categories of, in the categories of risk, you said you want to start there. What will you say your risks are, your categories are? Well, personally, at conferences, I stay on my own network. That is, I think the world gets better when you bring your own network in some sense. Um, and, and not rely on networks provided by others. I wonder whether the device vendors will go more and more down that path. That is, whether the, as the, as the tablets merge, merge into more PC form factors, <coughs> whether you won't see 4G start to become a component of that architecture just for, to get around this problem. You know, but even then, it'll still be relatively low bandwidth. Well, if you're talking about bringing your own network, you've got to guarantee it is actually not being shifted to somebody's Wi-Fi as well. Because you never know. If you bring a MiFi from Verizon or AT&T, is there a chance that they're going to shift it to some Wi-Fi because, because the circuits are just just overloaded because of the 50,000 people at the conference in that yes. one like one-mile area? Great. Yeah. So do you still think about that? Oh, that's when you turn off Wi-Fi. Yeah, no, you can turn off Wi-Fi, but I've even heard that cell conversations are being forced over Wi-Fi just to handle the load. Even if the device is off on the data? data? Yeah. That's kind of cool. I've heard that. Even Uh, if data is off, that could be happening. I want to, does the, does the, you know, AT&T sells you that cell phone extender widget which runs in your home network? That's what I was talking about before. Yeah. Does, does That's that what I was just talking it? about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because you never know, you know, cell phone extenders are also Wi-Fi endpoints in some cases. Yes. And they're using relatively the same technology because they're just plugging into the wall. Yeah. 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 So, are they running over the physical network versus running over the ether and trying to offload the number of circuits that are required to make the call where they can actually pump that data way outside of the congested area and say, okay, now make the call? Yeah. Well, it always amused me when I'm in a hotel room to go and surf around and see whose network, whose yeah, devices are on and what you can get. Well, it's unbelievable it, what you can get. You know, you know what's funny is also just going back to what you're saying about trade shows, is like, you know, a lot – you know, a lot of times what I see, and even vendors next to me, like when they're setting up booths, you know, they, they've it's like basically become a best practice, practice to issue the existing show wireless and find the vendor with the strongest signal next to you with an open with an open hotspot yeah. and just use their connection, right? Um, yeah. And and so I think that there's, uh, you know, the the interesting point that was brought up earlier was this notion of availability versus security. I mean, and especially if you think about it in the context of what you're trying to do, everybody's multitasking during these shows, even the vendors, right? They're, they've got, uh, they've got their day jobs other than being, you know, uh, other than being in the booth, in the booth and you've got your day job on top of walking around and collecting stress balls. Um, but, uh, or whatever tchotchkes you like, but, you know, I think that uh, at any given time, you're, you're constantly checking email, you're constantly have a need to connect. And at some point it becomes, it almost becomes his desperation, you know, and and so that's really the, that's really when things uh, hit the fan. Is like, what do you do when you absolutely have to connect and there is no trustworthy mechanism with which to establish a connection? So when I have to work, or when I have to, uh, you know, when I have to use that USB key, or when I have to use that untrusted network, uh, you know, how do I protect myself? You know what exactly. I mean? Rather than saying what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I think the best way to think about it is, you know, and by the way, this is the entire, uh, you know, Bromium story is that is that we have to accept the inevitability 
that we will be in a place where we will be forced to make a decision, um, a, a, you know, a trust decision that we are not qualified to make due to necessity, productivity, uh, availability, call it what you will. Right? Well, I, uh, I agree with that 100% because I, I had a question when we first started with, uh, with Ed saying, you know, all these things that you know or don't know and trust. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I'm qualified to know all that. And, and I've been doing this for a long time. I, I don't know what I could make advice to someone else. So I'm really interested to see uh, what you guys are saying about this here. Well, I, I could just tell you for a fact. My, you know, I know that Simon's got to give me a call because he's with a customer and my phone's at 1%. I'm going to borrow a charger. Absolutely. Right. I mean, and so you don't know what, what, what's going on with that charger. So I'm not, they, we've I'm talked not, about some of the theoretical attacks, but maybe for this podcast, we might want to just uh, cover that Well, they're not theoretical. Quickly. They've all been done at, at, at Black yeah. Hat and so, some of the others. You never know saying, for showing saying, up at other well, conferences. So guys, okay. Okay. All, I'm, all I'm saying is that, that I think that there's a very, very uh, – the, the, in general, the, the conversation that we're having is, is taking the shape – uh, of almost every security conversation, which is like, you know, how do we how do we educate people to do the right thing? And I think we need to design every security solution, every security approach, with the assumption that that people will do the wrong thing, whether on, on purpose or not. That's I all. would agree with you there. You know, Absolutely, I, would agree with you there. And when boy, I mean, what the interesting thing is is that, like, for example, everything we're talking about has some sort of compensating control or mechanism and I mean for example if I'm using a Windows machine, Bromium is a compensating control. Is there a weakness? You've pointed out there is one. If I don't have a Mac, if I don't have a Windows box, I can't run it, so therefore I have to use my Mac, which has no oh. compensating control other than my own knowledge. Yeah. So I don't have something built in and so what's those knowledge points that you need to worry about? And I mean to me you, you you hit it right, Tal, by saying there's that point in time where you have to do work. Right. Well, let's break when the you threats to... down a little bit, Ed. You said the, the wireless. We, I think we got that covered. And then the other threat was needing to charge up. So I don't think a laptop would be affected by the charge-up uh, threat. You can't really break into a laptop through the power port. No, because you're actually using a three-prong point, a three-point plug and all that. Right, right. So that one's probably covered, but for a lap, for a cell phone or tablet computer, you normally want a USB port to plug in and charge, and that's where we have a vulnerability, right? And I, I said theoretical, but I guess what you're telling me is these have been proven. The only uh, solution to that one is to bring your own charging brick. But, that's but if your charging say, brick burns out, which I've had one do, then if you have your you laptop, to charge off your laptop. And you can always plug your charging brick from someone else's USB port because there's no way they could attack the charging brick. It's almost like a man in the middle or bastion host charging brick. Yeah, yeah a charging brick is um, plugged into the wall, not a USB port. So you're so I could so I could actually purchase a charging brick and tell my boss it's a security device. Well, I bring two with me. Yeah, I have a spare always. So charging brick is not just for charging. It's more of a security device to prevent me from getting attacked during a trade show. That's one op look of it. I actually keep one because I want to charge both all my devices without bringing my laptop. <laughs> so Mrs. Y yeah. just joined I mean, I us carry, to, I, to, to quick, quick, quickly catch her up. Um, Mrs. Y, we are talking about how to protect yourself at conferences, and we have with us Bromium folks, Tal, Klein, and... Simon Crosby, and they gave up, came up with a good point, and that is there are things you there are, there are times when you're going to absolutely have to trust somebody because you have to get your job done while at a conference, running out yeah. of power on your phone and things like that. But I do uh, I do actually humiliate conferences that have open Wi-Fi and things like that. <clears throat> Especially, uh, I think it was RSA Security Conference had open Wi-Fi this past year. Yeah. <laughs> Enough said. I mean, <clears throat> so so you can criticize them, but at, at some point, that, well, the, the point that we got, that we got to earlier is that you know, at some point during the day, because we all have day jobs, even the even the vendors at the trade shows have day jobs, right? And it's, at some point, there's going to be either a phone call that you have to make or an email that you have to send, and at that point, uh, you know, you are there's a, there's a strong possibility that you'll be forced to make. Uh, a decision that's against that, that's against every 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 security practice 
Yeah, uh, and if I have, to, and if I'm forced into that situation to do it because of a limitation from a conference, a very um, pricey conference, then I'm certainly going to voice that. And I did. I went on Twitter. I went on every piece of social media I could, and I voiced my discontent with that. I mean, it was a security conference, you know. So this is why. Did you see the inter interop had a um, wireless? system that gave you a self-signed uh, certificate that you could put on your device? Right. So we have you, now have we have the, the following suggestions. I still don't trust as, it, but <laughs> I mean we have the following suggestions is like if you have a Windows laptop, pick up Bromium and vCentury and put it on there and then you don't have to worry about your USB keys and and VPNs and all that sort of fun stuff. But if you don't don't I mean you got to make sure that understand that your VPN connections, not every connection going into it, may be 100% routed the right way. You don't know where it's being routed to before it hits your VPN. Um, and basically, one of the examples we got was the one where you you route to somewhere first and then launch your VPN and it never goes through your VPN. Or the other one was using the exact same Addy for customer facing stuff for your VPN as well as something else and never get there. Well, you've, got check, you've got to check your search, right? I mean, yeah. if, if, you know, if it doesn't match, then obviously you want to avoid it. And you also, <clears throat> I mean, frankly, when I go to conferences, if it's, a, if it's a hardcore security conference, the electronic devices stay in a safe in the room or somewhere. It, I mean, or the battery comes out of the cell phone. Um, I mean, I generally don't take computers to security conferences because I don't feel safe. I mean, if I or do... you take I mean, one that you know you're going to wipe out. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, the wireless gets turned off. I mean, I only turn it on when I need it. If I, I remember being at ShmooCon, and I walked up to Rob Fuller, and uh, they had secure wireless there, and I knew the guy who was running it. <laughs> it was the author of Kismet. <laughs> And, you know, he, he's like a nice guy, and they had a secure wireless network, and I didn't think he was going and messing around. But I looked at Rob Fuller, uh, who runs Nova Hackers and uh, also uh, ShmooCon Epilogue, and I said, are you getting on wireless? Because I'm still nervous. He goes, no, I'm not getting on wireless. That's why I have tethering. <laughs> That's good enough for me. Yeah, the author of a wireless hacking tool is not somebody's network you want to get on. He's probably doing research on you. <laughs> I mean, he was looking at all the traffic and he was looking at the stats. I don't think he was inspecting the content. Um, and I certainly, even on a secure wireless network, I'm still going to use secure options. But, um, yeah, I just don't Nothing, I think so. I don't think so. a lot of chances. <laughs> And I, that begs the question: even with, if even if it had even if I did have vCentury and the Bromium team, product on my laptop for whatever reason, I think even at a conference, there's some places I just would not go. And if I do have to for whatever reason, and in the past I've had to. I mean, there's, there's a case in point. You know, Tourism. I always go. I always go back to one place I know is secure through what I consider to be a secure connection. In other words, I check the certificates. I always go to this one place that's inside of a secure location. Is that and from there, like a remote, I may launch out. Like a remote desktop you're talking about, like RDP to somewhere probably else? Using, probably using a VPN to contact to a remote desktop and from there going to somewhere else. I mean, to be honest Absolutely. with you, I, would, I wouldn't risk my corporate or anyone else's uh, VPN. So I would worry about that. I would worry that some credentials are being captured somehow. So frankly, I'm more likely to use the Tor network if I'm at a conference. I'm not going to use my corporate VPN. I don't want to try and act from a host, even the hotel room. I'm very particular about whether or not it, it's like least privilege I consider in a hotel room or at a conference. And so I am going to use Tor or maybe I'll have a you know, a cheap Swedish VPN account, um, something like that, that, you know, is a throwaway and that I don't care about. I think 
that when you go to a conference, the best way to protect yourself when you go to a conference or and you're at the hotel or the airport or wherever is to pretend that you are a member of WikiLeaks or you're a reporter. You know, don't if you can have a cell phone with a removable SIM, that's good. If you can, uh, you know, use the tour network at the airport. Treat yourself. Don't like contaminate your business networks. Yeah. Well, I think I think the, the what I'm hearing from you guys is is you know what I hear a lot. It's like I was just at Ions at, in Dallas, and before that, I was at the Gartner Conference in DC. And and the thing is that you guys are speaking like like people who have a who are very cognizant of the security footprint and are willing to make certain sacrifices uh, in uh, in productivity for the sake of security. And and I think that the 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 thing this notion of disconnecting or this notion of not bringing things with you or you know, being cognizant of your surroundings is not something that's always available to, you know, to your your layperson. You know what I mean, or the person who's who's at the show, right? I I just had to teach um, I had to teach non technical people just now how to use portable apps on an iron key with uh, Enigmail, the Enigmail uh, plugin for Thunderbird. I had to like do an interpretive dance around asymmetric key <laughs> encryption, okay? You know, it, you know, this is your public key. Do you share your private key? No. I mean, it's yeah, I unfortunately with what has been going on in the news lately, I think it's even more important that these that everybody learns yes, it's convenient, but learns how to use it. You know, it's, what's interesting about that is, is um, you know, as we do these things, right, as people become more, let's say, uh, educated, the, 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 the logic goes that the attackers will then, you know, focus on, on the vectors that are deemed whitelisted um, as the mechanisms of attack, you know. And, and I, I like Ed's example of the, uh, of the phone charger because, honestly, it's, it's, if I'm asking to borrow somebody's phone charger, if I'm using somebody else's phone charger, it's pr it's, it's probably an act of desperation, not out of convenience. That is, you know, um, you know, that there's, there's a situation, there are always going to be situations at which our, um, you, you know, the immediate needs, of, the immediate needs of our day-to-day uh, -day jobs will supersede um, any existing, uh, you know, security policies that we've built for ourselves, whether those are least privileged or, um, or anything to that extent, you know, and, and and at that point, you know, one of the things that's missing, and the reason we have to go through all these lengths, is because the technologies built into the devices, into the computing devices that we carry, don't protect us holistically today. And that is why we have to go through, we have to suffer so much and, and be proactive and all that kind of stuff. You know, and, and to a large extent, you know, that's really been the driving force of what we're, you know, why I like working at Bromine, right? It's, it's this whole notion of, would we still have to worry about all of these things if, uh, you know, if our computing devices were more trustworthy? Yes. I mean, there, you're never going to, that's the nature of the human mind, right? I mean, that's just, the, I think that we'll always have to worry. There's always going to be a way to break something. And uh, it's been since time immemorial, right? And I, I don't think that's ever going to change. <clears throat> And I'm looking at it and going, there's got to be a certain, and I think you're right, there's going to be attacks against whitelisted things that people are going to be doing. I mean, what do I whitelist? I know what I whitelist and how I access my critical resources and access anything I consider critical. It's always through, as I said, I, I VPN. I use a method to VPN in. I do memorize my fingerprints and check my keys and certain things about my certificate that I constantly do as part of what I do. Even if I pre-share the certificate, I may still verify it because I don't know if someone's finally broken that. And then I go off and use things from a well-known secure location that is somewhere that is actually not even those critical resources. I just use it as a jump point. But is everybody going to go to that extent? Absolutely not. Well, it depends. And even on if, if people knew, I, and if people knew I was which way I was taking that 
which tools I was using, they would attack those tools without doubt. I mean, do, for example, I, I don't use wireless, but, you know, when I'm at conferences, but at the same time, I also know that cellular goes over wireless depending on how the conference does their cellular extenders. Yeah, you can man in the middle of cellular pretty easily. So, And you can man in the middle of cellular pretty easy as well. So you've got all these different things that you have to worry about. And while I like vCentury, I know that it doesn't – I mean, for example, in my environment, with my thing, I couldn't – there's only one person in my whole company using Windows. And that's it. Everybody oh, yeah. else is using I, a Mac. Of course – how about this? You know, I, I'm just telling you the the, the philosoph- philosophical approach from which you know we come from, which is this notion. And if that you had vCentury for my iPad and vCentury for my iPhone and vCentury for my Mac, I'd be a whole lot happier. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and if oh, you yeah. had vCentury, if you had vCentury for my virtual desktop that I finally get to, I'd be all that happier too. I mean, I don't mind. I mean, the other thing is security, in my mind, absolutely, utterly needs to be invisible. It needs to be transparent. The user should not need, know it's even there until it rears up and says you're doing something wrong or yeah, there is a problem. Yeah, that's but then the question the I was going to ask. Yeah, so, but so, so you get into so the email encryption methods like identity-based encryption, which I've been researching lately, and while – the algorithms are really good. The implementations, in most cases, leave something to be desired. Plus, there's the issue of the private key generator either being in the cloud or being not like hold, being uh, holding people's private keys without, you know. And so, if it's subpoenaed or if it's hacked into, I mean, so or those private keys are sitting on the laptop. The laptop is not encrypted. Therefore, anybody right. and I mean, their uncle can get to it, and now you have the private key. Well, yeah, but so, uh, but identity-based encryption is seeking to make email encryption easier. But then, by doing that, there's a trade-off. So, absolutely. I, I mean, that's my point. It, it's when, it, you know, with ease of use comes a trade-off. It, there doesn't seem to be a mesh of easy and secure. <laughs> well, you well think it's getting I'm... better. It's getting better. Look, I mean, Birmingham is. So, I mean, the the. The philosophy of Chromium is that every device needs to be able to fundamentally secure itself, okay? And 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 at any point in time, you know, there's we're we're at some point in progress on that, and we're not all the way there. But you know, it's definitely the case that as an industry, we are doing better, we're doing better than we were. That yeah, is, but, I mean, most, I mean most we're of, saying really, I mean, the numbers look like you are people. We're not doing better. No, yeah, but I, mean, I think okay, there's a, so I wait. think there's a perception problem because Simon, mean, you think we're doing better, yeah. but every time I talk to a non-security related person, I mean, I got a tweet over something about the, a guy just basically saying he hates security because and it I, just I, gets in his way. And you know what? I, I, I think you're right, Ed, because I'm I'm seeing that it's not better because when I look at the, I'm looking at the numbers, I'm looking at the stats that come out, and I'm seeing, you know, it's that it's not so. Clearly, there. But, but, wait, but it's not is based on what? So the problem really is that we have enterprise security mindset is based on the need the need to protect really shitty endpoints and shitty operating systems from the mid '90s, and enterprise security practice <clears throat> is kind of stuck in this time warp, which is you know 1995 until 2002. And it doesn't help at all, okay? And by the way, things look like they're getting worse because none of the stuff that people are doing actually helps. However, it is absolutely the case that today's operating systems are much, much, much better than they were. And, you know, there's, that one is, is, that's incontrovertible. I mean, you know, Windows 7 and Windows 8 are just vastly better than Windows XP. And the problem is a lot of people still Windows XP. So that's the real challenge, right, is that what we tend to be doing is trying to secure more and more legacy crap, and it's time to move forward. Well, I mean, but that's not, but that's, okay, so that's a business issue. That's, you know, businesses who insist on keep use, uh, on still wanting to use XP, right? Actually, 
Actually, I don't think it's a business issue. I think it's a human issue. I think it's that, look, if you, if you said, look, I, I think that all of this stuff around client and new forms, of, new forms of client form factors and cloud basically says, well, what the hell is the point of this existing IT practice? For example, why do you still have a proxy? It does nothing useful at all. Why do you have an IDS or an IPS? Because it doesn't help either. Okay? But we have reams of people whose jobs there are to buy, maintain, and sell this stuff. Oh, agreed. IDS, for example, and signatures. Um, it, oh. it, it's this closed world solution for an open world problem. Exactly. And uh, so, I, I mean, I'm in agreement, but, you know, yes, it's, so it really is a business problem because it impacts to change that ecosystem to make that paradigm shift puts, threatens the models of hundreds of businesses, security businesses. Yeah. Well, they have no incentive to change. And by the way, it threatens the jobs of hundreds of IT workers. Right? Yep. I mean, I, when I go to, say, a McAfee focus conference, you know, the people who are there are the people whose livelihood, whose salaries are paid because they run McAfee stuff, right? Okay, good for them. But they don't want a brand new model of, of endpoint security where there's no McAfee, for example, on my iPad. What do they do there? Nothing. And so actually the world would be a lot better off if we could just, you know, retire us all. And you, know, you, you get what I mean, right? That is, well, yeah. I, hold on. I, I get confused, that, but I mean, we, we just confused that, endpoint protection and server protection. So let's. Well, no, no, we didn't. No, we didn't. They're no, both tied. I think they're both seriously tied together even. I mean, you can't. Endpoint, I mean, endpoint security is a, a major part of server security in a lot of ways. I mean, people are still doing yeah. that. Is an easy way. To, but, easy. but I guess what I'm trying to say is that it, there's still a need to protect the servers and the data center. And so here's how it turns out. You need to protect hold on, your cloud. You need I'm to protect your that, cloud. Uh, hold on, one person at a time. Even you were yeah. finishing. I'm not saying that um, these new application designs aren't needed, we're going to be able to get there. And as we can build security into the applications and upgrade our operating systems, then it's less of a concern. But there are still a number of legacy applications being served in legacy data centers that need this sort of defense in depth strategy to protect You know what? So I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. Defense in depth has, you know, first of all, it's a labor practice thing, okay? And secondly, it's a, vendor, it's a bunch of vendor bullshit, okay? Vendors love defense in depth because what it really means is, oh, this product doesn't solve that problem, you buy this other one too, okay? And none of these products actually solve the problem because that's, the, that's why we're still on this call, okay? No, they, so they don't they, solve the problem 100%, but they, they, each one helps a little bit. We just released a study that, okay. that shows the gaps. And I'm not Great. saying there aren't gaps in this strategy. I do believe we all need to improve our architecture be more uh, applications anywhere, leveraging cloud technology and building security into the application. Okay, but so here's we're not the, there yet. Wait, wait, wait. Here's the fundamental problem with what you said. There is nothing you can ever do to quantify how much better any more depth makes it. So here's the I'm, I sat down with the we, CEO. We have, wait, we have done studies. There is a, there's a way wait. to quantify that. There is, right, there's no way to quantify it, so the only thing to do is to buy more shit. That doesn't work. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. There is, um, there are a, a defined number of attacks which can be run through these um, as a test. And no. you can see that, that combinations yeah, yeah, but those are well-known, even those are well-known attacks. When you start uh, thinking about hey, this stuff, hey, listen, it's even. not the well-known attacks that I'm worried about. I'm already protecting against the well-known attacks. I'm concerned about... The Hold unknown on. attacks, the unknown you're, you're unknowns. Protecting, you're protecting against the 60% of the known attacks, or with defense in depth, you might be covering 80% of the well-known attacks. The well, problem is, on you're average, right. you're probably right, but I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about me particularly. If I'm protecting against all the, what I consider to be the known attacks, well-known attacks, you know, we're talking about, it's not those that are bothering me. 
It's actually oh, those it's unknown crazy. attacks that are really but, the concern, and that's where tools like Bromium come into play. Yeah, but, or but, newer ways of looking at things. But Edward, most <laughs> of them are most. They show the studies are showing that most hacks are opportunistic. That most and most organizations have such poor security that you can you can use the simplest attack. That's right. Absolutely, I agree with you there. I mean, think that's a that's a different problem. But those and people, there's, there's I mean, we're still talking, people if you, you know, using SQL uh, injection attacks and other things that could be prevented easily. Right, you because think default, that, that, you that's think because of different. That's, I mean, you're talking about a different thing, and that's you're absolutely right. And you're talking about default passwords, and you're absolutely right. Why those things are on, some of those things are on the internet, I'll never know. But I'm talking about those are known attacks. People don't cover them. You're right. They should. Yeah. That's Look, a fault I, in enterprise security today. But I'm talking about those things that aren't known. You just mentioned a bunch of things that aren't that are known. I have no idea what falls into the list of what's not known. Yeah, but you can't manage that. That's an open world problem. You can only no, manage. I can that do my. No, I, I think effect. I. Can, I think I can. I can put in preventatives that are more behavioral or. Oh, yeah, More everybody says that, and they don't work. They, that's, I think that's such a fib. That's such a misnomer. So <laughs> wait or, I can do, or I can do what Bromium does and do something very, very similar. Hey, let's try and agree on one If I combine the technology. Hey, Ed, let's try and get everybody yeah. to agree on one thing. Turing was right. Okay? Turing was right. Yeah. Okay, so let's True. talk about behavioral crap or better analytics this or whatever. It's all nonsense. It is impossible provably to detect, okay, to detect everything. So why don't we just agree on that and move forward. Now, my book is this. If it's a known attack, any product that cannot detect it should be thrown out. That is, I'm not interested in what percentage of known malware a particular technology detects. If it cannot get 100%, it should be thrown out, okay? That is not defensible. And the problem is they're all crap. They don't do it. There is not a single product that detects 100% of known attacks. Right. And so right. what's systems that are fundamentally secure because none of this defense in depth stuff works. So let me tell you my story, which, you, which, you, uh, which I didn't get a chance to complete earlier. I sat down with the CISO of NATO, okay? He is now required to have two of everything, two firewalls, two, uh, two IDSs, two IPSs, two of everything, uh -oh. right? I see where this is going. Right, he, from different vendors. And he, so he doubles his cost for sure, doubles his administration cost, everything. And then I asked the guy, okay, so how much more secure are you? And he gave me an answer a little bit like your answer even, which is, well, he might be more, but nobody yeah, can tell. Probably 5% more. So instead of 70, he's 75 maybe. <laughs> something like that. Exactly. Hey, but let me ask you something. Don't you believe that for every administrative silo you introduce into an infrastructure, you're actually creating a gap? Well, that's yeah. an interesting analysis that needs to be considered, yes. You know, so Simon and I both, I mean, so look, I, I happen to believe that, I also have to believe the defense in depth is a red herring. Like, usually when somebody brings it up, I, I usually say that I think most, most enterprises that, that subscribe to defense in depth are drowning in it. Um, and, and, you know, it's really what, I, what I'm seeing is like, you know, I'll, I'll talk to somebody and I'll say, well, you know, what are you guys doing about, you know, I'll talk to some guy and I'll say, well, what are you guys doing, uh, um, you know, about about targeted attacks? And he says, well, we've got two things. We've got, you know, FireEye in the data, data center and we've got next generation firewalls. And on the endpoint, we've got EPO plus blah, 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 blah. And I was like, are they all being administered by the same team? That is when you guys push out an update, you know, and, and usually I'll hear some horror story about how one, uh, you know, when they, up, when they updated their whitelisting uh, thing, they killed, they, they accidentally disabled one of their, uh, you know, one of their antivirus agents or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, there's always a story about how part of the defense in depth strategy ultimately ended up uh, hurting the uh, hurting the environment because of uh, all these siloed uh, all these administrative silos. Um, and then even beyond the administrative silos, you've got to worry about you know where you know where does one product stop and the other one start? You know, and, and getting buy off on it. And and by the way, at the end of the day. Aren't we really just uh, punishing the end user for our inability to protect them? That is, we're introducing guess, so, so much friction guess, into, uh, into the day, into the workflow of this, this simple knowledge into the, into the knowledge worker that we leave them no choice but to turn us off. 
exactly. But I'm looking at I'm looking at this and going. When I think defense in depth, I'm not actually thinking, you know, doing two of everything or whatever because I want to improve overall security for a single attack vector. I'm thinking defense in depth because there are so many attack vectors. I got a DMZ. I got something on the other side of that. And the access to the data behind whatever defensive measure that there is in there is being accessed from different locations. For example, I may put a secondary firewall in front of a SQL server farm because I know it's being accessed for not only from application A, but this other application somewhere else I just found out about or another one somewhere else. And I have no grasp of what actually all the attack vectors are because they're changing almost every day. A firewall is right. so, a waste of time anyway, though. But well, you know, it's not. But actually, you understand my con. You understand my point. It's just. To, it, <laughs> it mean, it's I'm looking at that way is that you know you have a lot of different vectors of attack that could be internal, external, right beside you, cellular, Wi-Fi. It could be because of somebody took home and didn't have a, it might, it lost a laptop. You have no idea where this stuff is coming from. And to me, putting a defense in depth in place is not about saying, I understand all that, saying, I found out about this, now I need to cover it. Does this initial one cover that, that particular new vector? And the answer probably is no. Could it cover it? Probably not, because the vector isn't even touching that part of my network or that part of anything. I have a new vector, a new networking, a new anything. I'm coming in through a different, completely different set of locations. You just don't know, right? Not yeah, everybody I mean, has a simple network that you got one in, one out anymore. If I had one in, one out from everything, and I could protect just that one area, oh, yeah, it would make my life a lot simpler. But now we have hundreds of ins, hundreds of outs. True, but we, we did mention firewalls, and there have been problems in the past with uh, lack of security, and there are now a number of regulations that require the use of, of different but technologies. You, let me ask you this. Let's go back to the beginning really quick. You just talked – your firewall can only protect me if I'm going through it. That is, if I'm in line, you know, if I'm going through the enterprise perimeter to go out. So at the trade show – is your firewall doing your enterprise any good when I'm when I'm doing my when I'm doing whatever I'm going to do? No, it depends I, on I where would, your firewall is. I mean, doesn't yes, it? I would argue that firewalls and IDS and IPS things like that are designed to protect quote unquote the jewels to the kingdom. So your key stores, your financial and uh, human data. Really? Then they're doing a poor piss poor job. I mean, you think RSA security had a firewall? I'm betting they did. You know, they may not have had one for the internal attack vector. Oh, no, they did. No, one, the external. I'm betting, no I'm one's betting saying it's a panacea. <laughs> no one's saying it's a panacea. You got a firewall check. It's like that uh, Monty you Python where the lady's getting ready to have a baby, and they, the doctor's like, oh, we got the machine that goes beep. Yep. We're good. We must be ready to go, I right? Think, I think 90% of all security tools fall into that category. Probably. I think that you remember, remember, I mean, I also think in answer to Tal's question is like it depends on where I put that firewall. If it's like in my bastion and I'm I outside of it, it's useless to me. We have to give up on the perimeter to defend the end user. Nobody is going – like the, we are becoming more and more dis, uh, distributed as a workforce. Um, you know, we're, yeah. we're, accessing, we're accessing corporate resources. Uh, through devices that are not tethered to the, to the enterprise perimeter. So we need to stop relying on the, – the perimeter has become a crutch. That is, I believe that anything you put in your data center that is not that is not targeted purely at protecting your data center rather than protecting the user is a waste of time. Wow. Okay. Well, I think we're getting to the heart of the matter here, and that what you just said right there is really the heart of the matter. I think that's that's what we need to be talking about. As a actually, industry. it's not about protecting the user either. It's about protecting your data. Nothing in your corporate but policies the, so says Ed, I'm going to protect changing, the user. What's changing is that the data is everywhere now. The data is with the user, no matter where the user is. Ah, but again, That's I right. got to protect the user. There's a change. There's a the thing. Tal said protecting the user. Corporations aren't out there to protect the user. They're there to protect their data. 
and full stop, user has to take care of themselves. Actually, that's not that's not strictly true. But anyway, I mean, you're trying to draw too fine a brush over it. What tells you that's actually very important that people get on is get over the perimeter. It had a it, it's dead. It's dead. It's dead. Your VPN is useless. It's dead too. Get onto the fact that the device has to be able to protect itself without any of that stuff. It has to. Otherwise. I mean, because none of that stuff works. That's what you've spent the last five minutes going on about. None of the stuff works. So why don't we just get over the fact okay. that it doesn't work and get on with a different model? All right. I like that as a goal, Simon. But my question would be, how does an enterprise who is relying on firewalls, VPNs, IPSs, and all the other stuff today, and they don't have a cloud model, they don't have any data out in the cloud, how does an enterprise switch to getting rid of their VPN and let allowing. Me, let, let, let me rephrase that for you and, and use a different model. At the end of uh, the feudal age, uh, with the introduction of gunpowder, I'll bet you the last castle standing had the thickest walls, the biggest moat, the greatest chainmail, and the greatest crossbowmen in the world. But they didn't have cannons. So, so take that home. Take well, that home it's for there, is a, today. there is, there are a couple of castles that were built, Tal, that cannonballs just bounced off of. That's true. At the end of the and day, they're down in the down in the Caribbean right now, and they stand to this day. So the they the built day, something that cannonballs were useless against. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we we need to acknowledge that we have to adapt beyond the existing things that we have, and that we need to start. That we are incurring, if, if you know, for those of you who read the Phoenix Project, we are incurring technology debt inside of our defenses, and we need to stop and you know, lose track of what is working and what isn't working. That is, we want to believe the firewall is still protecting us. We have to ask ourselves, is it? You see what I'm saying? I think uh -huh. that for every for every security investment, we need to take a deep introspective look at whether we are actually doing, uh, you know. If any of our security investments are currently actually serving us and protecting us from what's out there from our enemies, um, and start to focus on whether we should be investing in a better architecture rather than investing in cumulative tools to follow the existing model that Fair is enough. moving to be outdated. So, so you're not suggesting we, we unplug all our firewalls and just no. have our, our exchange server exposed wide open to the Internet without – you know, protection and our, our finance applications, all that wide open on the internet. I'm saying, we still need so that. We still need I that. I could do that if Exchange those. was actually written to protect me. Ask yourself a better question. You should ask yourself, should Exchange be in my data center? That's an interesting <laughs> okay. Well, you know what I mean? like, and then I, I think, we're I think talking you, about a new era of threats and a, and a new way to protect against those threats. I, 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 exactly. I'm saying that, that, you know, we need to stop developing – uh, you know, new, new, better, new and better chainmail or new walls that can withstand. You know, they, they can uh, focus on the castle model and focus on the fact that that now we've got a completely different. We've got an air force. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We've got uh, satellites in space with lasers. Yeah. And so, yeah, exactly, right. So no sharks with lasers. Come on. In, yeah, in outer space. Yeah. So I think that the important thing here is is not to say let's you know. Let's just ditch everything and start over. But I'm saying start to take a holistic approach to understanding the value, the business value that you're getting out of your existing security investments and your existing security strategy. You know, and I think that that's, that is the point that Simon and I are really trying to drive home is that we, we don't believe that. Okay. And not only that, you have to worry about, I mean, while we all think we're perimeterless and for some things we are, there are still some smaller perimeters possibly available. I mean, the answer, and I know Evan's probably going to say this, the answer is going into the cloud. The answer may not actually be that either. We don't know. So if we're looking at everything and saying we're using XYZ and I need to protect my data, and I currently use these six clouds plus my data center, you know, I got to think, do I really need any of that? So I think that, I, I, I think you're making a valid point. And I think, I think out of this, I think that you're at least Starting to think along the direction that that you know we're you know we're vowing, which is you know it's really important to take stock of you know the 
to think of security as a business investment rather than as an arbitrary information protection investment. And if uh, there's a bunch of uh, big IT de decisions that need to be made, uh, you know, and security needs to, to be in lockstep with them. So if we're talking about moving workflows to the cloud, if we're talking about uh, you know having more mobile, more mobile workforce that's distributed across across a greater swath of devices, if we're talking about attacks that come at us uh, that today that today are unpreventable using existing security tools, we need to expand our horizons and take a holistic approach to securing not only our data center but our users. Because at the end of the day, the biggest attack vector to enterprise security is going to be the endpoint. Okay, I would agree with that. And we're going to keep that as the last thought for this particular podcast. Thank you, Tal. Thank you, Simon, for joining with us. That. Thanks a lot. It was, always, as always, fantastic. And what we'll do is actually in two weeks, you mentioned the Phoenix Project. One of the authors from the Phoenix Project will be joining us on the podcast, so please come on and join us. That should be a fairly lively conversation as well. Yep. And I look forward to everybody sticking around. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed.